Commissioner for Human Rights. Um, she's had a long and very distinguished career. Um, was previously the Assistant Secretary General and Deputy Executive Director of uh, the UN Population Fund. Um, she was also the National Director of Amnesty International Australia and the Executive De Deputy Secretary General of Amnesty International. We're particularly lucky to have Kate here. People that work with her, and I include myself for a brief spell amongst them, say she is a huge inspiration to work with. She practices what she preaches and she challenges people to be their best. Um, I, I can confirm this from my short time working with Kate, and I can't think of anyone better to help pilot the UN through these challenging times at this moment. Um, this series is the culmination of, uh, this, this talk today is a culmination of a series commemorating the 50th anniversary of the Foundational Human Rights Treaties. The series is focused on the transformational potential of human rights, the possibilities the treaties have given for advocates and individuals to claim justice that they were not able to claim before. At the same time, as we look around us, particularly these days, we see that this endeavor is unfulfilled. Subjugation, exploitation, and inequality continue. And human rights, the framework of human rights, has at times been criticized for failing to adequately advance and even perpetuating these hierarchies and inequalities. It is this issue of inequality that Kate will speak to today. Um, she will talk about the potential for human rights, the potential human rights has for transformational change, focusing particularly on the issue of inequality. Given Kate's long uh, experience working on these issues and at the fulcrum of all that's going on in U the UN and international community, I couldn't think of anyone better to address this issue today. Thank, Thank you. you very much. That's a really lovely uh, introduction. You know when someone says you've been working for a long time, it just means you're very old <laughs> and just struggling now to be relevant. <laughs> so uh, I see this as uh, the university is an appropriate place to attempt to demonstrate some degree of relevance. It's sort of like a test examination. I hope you won't be too tough on me. <laughs> Uh, now, thank, thank you for the gorgeous introduction. I didn't recognise myself except for the old bit. It was lovely what you said. Thank you to Sarah and uh, Randy and everyone who's worked to, to make it possible for us to be together at this time. I'm, I'm deeply grateful. Um, what I hope to do is give you a flavour of the things that are troubling us when gazing upon the world from a global standpoint through the lens of human rights. I hope I can talk to you in terms that might enable you to appreciate the viscerality of that struggle, not only the technicality of it. Um, and I will do that for some little while, which in a manner of pertaining to issues that I hope you won't find too irrelevant or tedious, but I'll then finish this also as quickly as I can uh, so that we can have a discussion. And I thank you for allowing me to monopolise the beginning statement of that discussion. It always strikes me that there's a risk that somehow it appears to us that human rights belong primarily in the courtroom, that they're things captured for law and for lawyers, and that they are matters of abstract, impersonal, rational adjudication. And I want to start in a very different place. All human rights are, are words, text, for that prototypical state called human. If you think about the business of 
anatomy, the science of appreciation, the physicality of this space we call human and that we attempt to capture through medical science. We think about anatomy being an explanation for the physicality of what it is to be of this species. Then human rights does perform the function not that dissimilar. It is the anatomy of the self existing in social, political and economic space. And most critically, it is a textual account of the prime primacy of a managed, contained and limited relationship between the state and the self. And with that in mind, I wanted to start less with rights and more with human. Do you know that uh, today there are underway some of the greatest shifts to the human being that has ever been seen in all of human history? Perhaps most uh, apparent is the fact that millions of people are today on the move. They're displaced from homes, communities and livelihoods by force of powerful dynamics of change. Conflict, crisis, climate, contagion. Hundreds of thousands of people from multiple countries the world over scrambling across their own countries and out of their own countries over the desert and sea at great personal risk in flight from what they see as being of even deeper risk, the risks of persecution, of pernicious poverty and of violence. More people on the move within and across borders than ever before in all of human history. Against a backdrop that is also particular with regards to the natural environment. A backdrop of natural resources in more rapid depletion and man-made climate instability. Terrible twins born of consumption at a rate that this poor village planet simply cannot sustain, bringing with them impacts that are worst for the people with the least and worst for those most directly dependent for their livelihoods on land and on oceans. Traditional livelihoods, eroded, depleted, driving more people for the first time in human history from rural and traditional living contexts into urban and peri-urban settings to eke out lives often absent basic dignity. For the first time in human history, more people living in urban settings than rural. And in this context, there is a deepening and seemingly intractable set of intra- and interstate conflicts, wars both by proxy and by direct intent, conflicts destroying civilian lives, homes, families and wrecking civilian infrastructure for justice, for health, for education, for culture, for memory, infrastructure for future. And in response, a rising tide of toxic hatred for the other, the fabrication of fictional criminalization of the other, woven out of these great demographic changes and the muck of deepening inequalities. A sour soup of xenophobia stood up by reckless political profiteers, the peddlers of fear, the pimps of prejudice, the pushers of the narcotic of bigotry. And yet, uh, 
with data, speech and information travelling at lightning speed around this human habitat, never before has our troubled world been so interconnected. And on that troubled world, there are alive today the largest generation of adolescents in all of human history. They're being at their most concentrated in places of greatest poverty, least opportunity and fewest prospects for prosperity. Where rides, where resides prosperity? In the places where also reside the largest generation of older people that the world has ever seen. The median age of Germany. Anybody? 47. The median age of Niger. 15. And yes, over the course of the past decade or more, we have turned the AIDS crisis around. We have halved maternal and infant mortality, but we deepened to unprecedented levels to inequality. How do we do this? Well, I think it's because we broke the rules. I think it's because leaders of privilege and obligation sought to rip up the rule book through their black sites, their torture cells in Bagram and Abu Ghraib, through the disgrace of Guantanamo Bay. You know, universal values and the international systems of rules that bring those alive, those have not changed. What has changed? in our living memory is compliance with those obligations. And it's compliance that is being eroded. It's a fallacy that walls, borders or fences erode our obligations to each other's rights. Walls within this human family on a small distressed planet in a globalised world, home to the largest population of young people in all of human history, walls are untruths. In this interconnected world, at a time on this climate-stressed planet, no country, nowhere, can rightfully stand apart, rightfully bury its head or absent itself from the global table of rights-filled solutions. Quite simply, there's no wall <coughs> barrier so high, nor border so patrolled, nor special identity nor privilege made so rarefied, no surveillance system, nor unmanned drone, no enmity so heartfelt, no friendship so rare, that on this domicile planet there can be placed between you and me such a distance that your rights do not count with me, that my rights do not matter to you that their rights do not register with us. No such distance exists upon this village planet with common sky, with common ocean, except that is in the fabrication of fantasist, sinister, populist ideologies whose destructive force feeds off an intentional manufacture of desperation, despair, and delusion. Friends, I don't know if any of you has flown uh, recently, but if you have no doubt, here, you benefited from international regulations that have helped your plane, or guided your plane to its safe landing. And I'm just guessing that when you disembarked you were not greeted by someone who claimed that their national sovereignty had somehow been imperiled by the fact that local air traffic control had to conform to international agreed standards. Those of you checking your emails right now, very wise, because this speaker is going on. But even in doing that, you are relying on the international universal standards. 
Which prince or principality denounces mobile technology because it contravenes faith, culture or tradition? Even though those life-changing initiatives, innovations are about a few decades old. And of course, power seeks to control, but it does not seek to deprive itself of that technology. Which head of state, falling critically ill, denies himself access to the benefits of modern medical science, despite the fact that to access it is in contradiction of more traditional and culturally specific values? Gosh, good golly. Current efforts to challenge, erode or discount universal principles, international standards and international law is not a movement against hegemony. It is nothing more and nothing less than an effort to deteriorate the obligations of the powerful to answer for those who have the least power. Yep, you better. Western governments are bustling and shifting against the strictures and obligations of those standards as refugees and migratory movements reach pressure point pinnacles, pushed as these destination governments are by the heightened anxieties of their ageing populations. Amid, too, the consequences of callous criminal acts, the so-called terrorist violence, and in the aftermath of economic crisis. That's true. And of course, claiming that the International Criminal Court is targeting certain countries unfairly, certain states are actively seeking out impunities, protections. But their talk of withdrawal from the Rome Statute is self-interested. Aren't leaders seeking to benefit from the shield of immunity engaging in a willful, self-serving effort to deprive their own people of the very particular protection against heinous, widespread crimes that only international law can provide. As the High Commissioner for Human Rights has emphasised, we can safeguard our societies by standing firm on the universal principles of justice or we can cast away moorings of law laid down to save the world from horror. We can cast them away and in doing so turn away from the screams as impunity overwhelms women, men and children in wave upon wave of abuse. Somehow we've forgotten that every country that joins the United Nations does so without coercion. And as it forms its membership with the United, not the uniform, but the United Nations, it does so freely. And it signs on to basic principles of universal justice, the Charter Principles, further enshrined and elaborated in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, in international covenants, treaties, conventions and declarations. That Charter puts human rights first, above even peace or security or development. Human rights, principles that do not prevent our diversity, they protect it. Principles that do not limit our diverse expression, they ensure it. Principles that do not restrict our access to culture or belief or opinion, they guarantee it. And those principles set out what's more, the terms and conditions under which we may exercise these rights without cost to the exercise of anyone else's rights. And the opposite of these universal foundational principles upheld, selfishness, bullying, bigotry, tyranny, toxic stepping stones, a perverse paving of pathways to privation, to suffering, to conflict and ultimately atrocity. Contempt for the other, hatred of the foreigner, distrust of those who allegedly 
look or love or worship differently, aided and abetted by clamps, downs on freedom of the press, by stepped up surveillance in cyberspace, encroachment on public movement, closure of national borders to people fleeing persecution, gagging of activists, and the deprivation even of life-saving services such as those essential for sexual and reproductive health and dignity. Friends, if you ask me, the pounding of these malicious fists grows louder and louder on the doors of our dignity, of our privacy, of our mental and physical integrity, and against our freedom. This has to be resisted. After all, humanity has walked down this path before we know only too well where it leads. It leads to a dead end, to death-ridden ends. Small, mundane acts of everyday content, flourishing in the common garden variety intimidation, inflating into brutalising discrimination against the other, fueling popular persecution under whose caustic clouds we then so casually tumble our way down into conflict's callous catastrophe. Perhaps to many, uh, these matters today appear primarily to be ones of party politics, and for sure, certain parties' politicians, the world round, peddle pernicious policies in a pugnacious pursuit of power. But you know, I don't really reckon it's about one political party versus another. Okay, so maybe it is about one particular leader and his or her personal characteristics or approach in contrast to one other's. I don't know, the victor is compared to the vanquished. And for sure, let's be very clear, there are leaders across all walks of life, I might add, lavishing themselves with illegitimate license for a lecherous looting of power spoils. Come, it's not really about one leader or another. So maybe it is about uh, economic systems, you know, a capricious, callous, cash-coveting cruelty of unaccountable capitalism or, oh wait a minute, uh, of communism too. But it's not just a question of one economic system versus another. I would suggest, more fundamentally, more far-reaching than one election, one government, one president, one prime minister, one referendum, one system, there is underway today, as far as the eye can see, a deep struggle. A struggle to protect hard-won, mutual, and reciprocated recognition that we all are born in dignity and rights. And in this struggle for rights, there's no north or south, there's no right or left, there's neither east nor west. There's only the humane and the inhumane. Because it's about our rights, our rights not to be subjected to hate or violence or discrimination, to not be coerced, to not be deprived arbitrarily of our liberty or to be denied our voice. Rights. Golden threads weaving a just course from the courtroom to the boardroom to the schoolroom to the bedroom. Friends, you don't have to like me to respect my rights. I don't have to be like you to uphold your rights. We don't have to agree with each other to defend each other's rights. Rights are not a beauty parade, they're not a reward system, they're not some kind of nepotistic prize for good behaviour. And they're not the dispensation of the powerful to the powerless. They are, quite simply, that which cannot be taken from us. Rights, therefore, are for the best and for the worst of us, for each and every one of us, to the exclusion of none of us, in the interests of all of us. And against these attacks, they must be defended. Rights, after all, are verbs, not nouns. So, in the face of all of this, what can we and what must we do? Stand up. We must use our rights to stand up for rights. We can be doctors, but let's dignify universal access to health care regardless of a patient's identity 
of social status. We can be lawyers who cherish the rule of law but uphold equality before the courts and defend judicial independence. We can be journalists who love the truth, who prize evidence, protect fact and diversify voice. We can be scientists but in pursuit of knowledge without fear or favour, seeking to deploy the fruits of knowledge for the betterment of the planet under strain, a climate undergoing hurtling change and a people undergoing inconceivable suffering. We can be innovators and creators, but let's do it so that more rapidly and comprehensively we replace unfairness and exclusion with something more equal, something more inclusive, something more sustainable. And we can and should be dissidents who speak truth to power, not for our own elevation, but rather for the elevation of that in which we believe, that which we know to be true. We can be artists who disturb and provoke and illuminate and enchant. We can be lovers who seek first each other's freely given consent. We can be philosophers who seek to understand and thus erode our ancient practices of cruelty against each other. We can be economists, but in search of a more just distribution of wealth. We can be workers for rights rather than consumers of entitlements. We can be heroes. Perhaps, in fact, we must be heroes and not just for one day. Heroes not for our own rights in the first instance, but for their rights first. Stand up for someone's rights today. I know it's not easy. But in this, please take heart, for though it may be a most poor and withered thing, even in the darkest cells of the cruelest prison, in fragile settlements perched high on remote mountaintops, in the midst of sprawling resource-depleted refugee camps, scampering along barely shoulder-wide alleyways of urban slums, heard in the call of street walkers and the banter of market stall owners, in the mutterings of farm labourers, in the songs of indigenous peoples, there, even without a single well-intentioned, carefully measured intervention by global elites, still there exists, even there, however sputtering or flickering, however overshadowed by the coercive power of the state, still there exists everywhere you go people who are standing up bravely for their and their communities' rights. You know, uh, the American black rights activist and singer, Billie Holiday, stood up for rights when she borrowed a poet's voice and sang out against the lynching of black Americans in the context of the United States, Southern States. She sang, Southern trees bear strange fruit, blood on the leaves, blood at the root. Black bodies swinging in the southern breeze, strange fruit hanging from the pop blood trees. Today in this world that so casually is betraying principle, so readily flourishing xenophobia, so easily seeing hatred and bigotry, strange fruit indeed is budding on populist trees, assassinations of environmentalists, imprisonment of journalists, arbitrary detention of political dissidents, removal of activist passports, rejection of our borders of the refugee in flight, indiscriminate rounding up of people wrongly denied access to citizen rights, bullying of children for their gender identity, sexual violence against women just because you can. Should such daily, banal cruelties pass us by unremarked? Basic qualities of the equalities be eroded without resistance? Nah. <laughs> We've got to stand up. And every day, in any way we can, stand up. Stand up as did thousands on the 21st of January. Stand up to stand out because of what we must stand for. Yes, uh, they do hunt down the dissidents. 
They are locking up truth-telling journalists. <coughs> they do bar the law-loving lawyer. And they may again even torch every book, chart, every page of reason. Turn every loving and tolerant word to ash. They could do it. But somehow we've got to know that even so, if and when we stand up together in through and for human rights, we're incombustible. Thank you. against practices rather than as values. So you can see my first proposition actually is that human rights are values by which to live one's life. They are not the Westphalian system. 
they predate any political system arrangement or architecture that we've ever developed. They don't need the Westphalian system. You know, you don't even need law. You just need people to stand up and determine that ego is not a basis by which to go about living lives. And to be absolutely clear-minded that my rights are the same as your rights and we are no more important than you. That's why for me, rights belong, yes they belong in the courtroom because that's the point of last resort for rights, just disability. But the law is an ass. You don't start with law, you start with much deeper seated principles. And but they have to go from the courtroom to the boardroom, meaning non-state actors are implicated, to the schoolroom, meaning, yeah, there's stuff you've got to sort of learn if you to enjoy the entitlements, to the bedroom, because it is about the most intimate of spaces as well. So just conceptually, I'm always keen to say there's a difference between principle, strategy, and tactics. The Westphalian system is somewhere between strategy and tactics. It is a product of a moment in time and certain colonial at the time and now neo-colonial arrangements that I'm perfectly happy to accept. But to say that human rights are somehow the children of that system or are the same as that system, yeah, I think you're missing the great gift of the eye, the fundamental idea that you and I are the same. And we're born in right. Yeah, I'm probably a bit uh, uh, fundamentalist in that regard. But this is why I go back to the idea of rights as knowledge about the human condition. It's, is it imperfect lexicon for the essence of being human? Yeah, sure. Has it been implemented imperfectly? Oh my God, we couldn't have done a better job. <laughs> we have developed such competencies in this regard and we have some really you know, benchmarks to really get up there with and one has been mentioned in Saudi Arabia. But they're no more or no less, like anatomy is no more or no less dependent on the public health system than human rights is dependent on the Westphalian system. It's just ways to do stuff. But even if that system collapses and some other system comes in, in place still, there is the question of what is it to be human? And what is it that's removed from us that makes us less than human? Well, at the moment, the best we've got is the text, the covenants, tried and true, tested in many courts, applied in many different experiments, the best we've got the rights. That's all. Now, I tried to give you what I think is a current set of challenges globally and with great local implication. And I spoke about crisis, conflict, contagion, and climate. And that, my thesis was, if you've got global problems, there are no local solutions. You're sitting next to someone from Yemen. That Yemen conflict, as indeed was 20 years ago, the Darfur conflict, is a product of all those forces I've just described. Actors, including one named, uh, will have to come to Saudi Arabia. We have such fun talking about Saudi Arabia. Yeah. Actors both inside and outside of Yemen are acting on that space. But at the same time, Yemen's natural resources have been eroded and are under attack. And the median age of people in Yemen, anybody? Median age of Yemen? 17. That's all I'm saying. There is no island. There is no archipelago left that's not bridged in some way. And you can't pick and choose connection. Not with data going around the world. You can't pick and choose. Not for good purpose. And that's basically the, the human rights message, in my view. And that makes it very interesting, <coughs> the range of obligations that we should demand member states uphold. Because the next thing we have to recognise, and this is why it probably does matter, although I'm, I'll, I'll burden you with a little correction or two, probably does matter that Saudi Arabia is in the room, because none of these standards was imposed on member states. 
They are the member state's own standards, for heaven's sake. The Convention on Ending Discrimination Against Women. The Covenants on Civil, Political, Economic, Social and Cultural. The Convention Against Torture. These were drafted, negotiated, fought over by member states. They are their own rules. All human rights system is asking member states to keep their promises. So when you come to something like the Human Rights <coughs> Council, which is now called the Council, as opposed to the Commission, um, you are talking to one piece of the human rights machine. There are several pieces. There are treaty bodies looking after those promises. There's a universal periodic review, which what it says on the can, it's universal and periodic <laughs> review. I find that personally very convenient because some of the times everything else is so obscure. Okay, so every four or five years, every single member state turns up in Geneva to give account of what it's done on its promises. There's special rapporteurs, what my dearest friend here, Agnes Calamar, is a special rapporteur for all the scummy, no good, low life, jelly belly, wheat need, lily livered things. Powerhouse to powerhouse, and she's a special rapporteur for extra judicial executions and other weird wacky things. They're special rapporteurs. So that over the time, the UN has developed a whole system of support to help member states know how to keep promises, ignorance is not offence. But would you choose to create in the Piazza for Rights, which is the Human Rights Council, it's just a town hall meeting, people. That's all it is. If we didn't have a piazza where member states were going to come together and talk about rights, you'd have to make it up. You'd have to invent it. You do not want any piazza that keeps the bad guys out and only has the good guys stroking their backs. That's not a piazza. That's a club. Now, there's a difference between piazza and club. I personally like clubs. I'm okay. But the, although I feel a bit like Groucho Marx has ever, never been a member of a club that had have been. I do feel a bit better, but I'm just saying the Human Rights Council is a piazza. And the minute you start to say, by definition, you don't belong there, where would you stop? Yes, Saudi Arabia is heinous by many measures, but to say it's uniquely heinous? Hello, China. Woohoo! G'day, Russia. How you going? Oh, look at what's happening in the United States. Who would you have left? You'd be meeting with yourself, and I've tried that. <laughs> but even then I don't agree. So, I've lost the last question, I can't read my writing. Syria. Did someone ask about Syria? Oh, I know what it was, hope. <laughs> That's a bit stupid. Oh, hope. Oh, I don't know what I'll do, I'll talk about Syria. <laughs> No, it's interesting. I, I, I personally feel enormously grateful that we have uh, the largest uh, population ever of younger people who are more digital, less bigoted, you know, I'm making generalisation, but I think it's pretty true, more um, modal, more inventive, uh, more creative. And I think it's probably true of most young, youthful generations anyway. The problem is they're going to come to power too late for us to take full advantage of that creativity. So my first hope is that we can find a way to accelerate access to power, get a succession plan going for this, uh, for this world, including at national levels, where whilst uh, in Yemen uh, the population is so young and so little, do you know what the median age of parliamentarians is? No, we were talking about Niger being 15, Germany being 47, the median age of parliaments around the world is 53. And then if you took all the heads of state, particularly heads of state for the youngest country, I mean, let's take Uganda, median age of Uganda, 15. Median age of its leader, oh, it's only one leader, but you know, it's <laughs> So, for me, I'm very hopeful that we can find a succession planning agenda, and I think there are some signs of that, to bring younger people, newer voices to power, because my generation 
really not to be trusted, hashtag handed over. Coming to Syria, I only mention it because, you know, strangely, for all the horror underscored by events in recent days of Syria in its seventh year of conflict, you know, for the first time, uh, the General Assembly at the end of the year agreed to establish an international, impartial, independent accountability mechanism for Syria. So that despite the fact that the member states can't agree on which jurisdiction should international crimes be adjudicated for Syria, for a range of reasons which you know better than I, nonetheless they have agreed to invest heavily in preserving evidence to forensic levels. That's the first time. Yes, ad hoc tribunals have been set up and then there's an almighty scramble, as you know, to get the evidence and the witnesses protected so that it can be controlled. For the first time, we're going to put in place a mother of a accountability mechanism for Syria. And that was a small ray of hope for me in the midst of the crazy piazza that is the Human Rights Council and all the other machinery. That is designed to hold I think we've probably got time for maybe one, maybe two more questions. Um, I have a quick question about the relation between accountability and money and how, especially for private actors who will, especially the corporations abroad, that will be some rights and then not have to answer to that issue because they're not member states. Um, so what's the relationship between that and the UN and how can we do something about that?
One of the gravest absences in competency for leadership today is the welcoming and appreciation of dissent and the voices of criticism. And yet, if you want to look for a predictor of where deep trouble is going and where dissent into scummy stuff is going to occur, one of the surest signs is the suppression of dissenting voices. But for me, human rights have to come much earlier. Uh, and on the money thing, I think it's part of a, an interesting uh, challenge for us. Like we were talking earlier today about the United Airlines story over the last couple of days, and appalling on so many levels. But interesting to see activist consumers having such a big hit on corporate activism. For me, if I have a criticism not of the principles but of the mechanisms and infrastructure rights, I would say it's been very statist, meaning obsessed with the state, and we understand why that is given the state's coercive power and its unique sovereign duty to law. But as a consequence, we've missed the ascendancy of economic actors. And we've missed the possibility of thinking about the relationship between ourselves as rights holders and ourselves as consumers. And I think it's a huge area for further development. But I want to come back, and maybe I'll just shut up now after this, but um, come back to something I, I want to leave you with really personally. And I, I, you know, um, and I think our colleague here from Newman uh, opens that up for us. It is sort of easy to talk about rights in the midst of privilege. And to think about rights as something you will get rather than rights obliging you to give away something. You're sitting in the midst of one of the greatest places of privilege there is. Not only in one of the greatest cities of privilege there is, but in a university that's in that Ivy League of privilege. I think it is a challenge to think about what is the narrative, and I'm not presuming that you all come from privilege, this is not my message, but I do want to notice how little narrative there is about surrendering disproportionate advantage in order to elevate others from disadvantage. There's almost no narrative about that anymore. And I, I, I really feel that's a, a gap, and I hope you might find a way to struggle with that. Because I think if we could get to that more viscerally and personally, I think a range of other things around costs and economic actors and so on come clear. But that being said, you know, we, uh, last year in September, off the back of terrible um, crimes in the context of DRC's, you know, the government's resistance in the Democratic Republic of Congo to democratic elections, um, we reported within a week to the Human Rights Council how many people had been killed as the government sought to suppress just plain peaceful assembly and peaceful freedom of expression. And off the back of that report, we entered into negotiations with a range of member states to introduce targeted economic sanctions, targeted at the leadership of DRC. And although DRC is still in some trouble, it almost immediately and noticeably had an impact. Isn't that amazing? So I think we can do much, much more in that area. I think it's a great question, but I don't think we've searched our hearts and minds sufficiently. Thank you so much, David. I'd love to continue the discussion longer, but I think we have to leave this room. So just if you could all join me in thank you.